So uh, I think we're going to kick things off here. Um, as, as many of you know, I'm, I'm Jim Clyber. I'm the chapter chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum in New York. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's event, uh, which is uh, entitled, uh, make sure that I get it right, uh, Startup Showcase Innovations in Product and Services Distribution. Uh, it looks like a really interesting uh, program here. Hi, everyone. We, want, we don't want to take up too much of your time. We want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, this is uh, hopefully uh, a very, very exciting event. Uh, a lot of uh, work and a lot of pre preparation has gone into uh, tonight. Uh, we want to uh, first of all thank our sponsors again, uh, Wiser and Mazars, uh, the folks uh, who have sponsored the food. So if you're enjoying some, some something tasty or, or a drink, uh, we know who to thank. Uh, the other thing that I uh, just wanted to let everyone know, um, a lot of people come up to me and ask me how uh, they can get involved and how they can uh, potentially pitch uh, their startup at tonight's event, because we're, we're going to be hosting another uh, few of these, hopefully before the end of the year. Uh, we actually have a link online um, with a short uh, Google survey. It really takes three minutes. If you or your friends uh, would like to present your company here in the future. Uh, we can't guarantee that you would get in because we have a lot of applicants, but uh, uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, so if you just go onto our website, uh, the MIT EF, uh, I think, dash NYC uh, dot org, uh, there's going to be a link there, uh, and you can just register. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's really what I wanted to let everyone know about. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I, uh, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Lori, who is the MC for tonight. So welcome, everybody. I'm Lori Holman. I am a board member here at the MIT Enterprise Forum. And I'm also uh, the head of the Emerging Company Venture Capital Practice here at Chadbourne. And a lot of you have been here to these events before. I love doing these events here. It's so exciting to hear the entrepreneurs pitch and to learn about the new technologies. So uh, we have five terrific companies. And we have two other judges on the panel. So if we could just take a minute, I'd like each of the judges to just introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their funds. You go first. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Schneider. I run. Um, a early stage growth firm called Kava Capital. We're about five years old. Uh, we have a hybrid model. We're not a traditional um, LP back fund. We have a uh, hybrid pledge and, and uh, uh, kind of holding company model. So uh, glad to talk to you about that afterwards, but it works really well for us. Um, we believe in investor alignment. So for us, it's about uh, all making money together, not necessarily extracting fees. Um, with that said, we invest almost exclusively in companies that um, are changing the world of marketing and marketing solutions uh, that are enabled by uh, technologies such as uh, data, um, uh, e-commerce, social, and, uh, and and mobile, but are B2B. Uh, we're not consumer-focused folks per se, although I do look at the consumer as the end game. And so um, we've spent time over the last five years making investments in a wide range of uh, pretty interesting companies, software, uh, mobile ad tech, uh, um, some, some really interesting um, solutions in um, kind of the, the, the uh, burgeoning areas of uh, real-time bidding, other things like that. And so uh, we're fairly well connected, we have two wonderful partners, and we work with a pretty, uh, a set of unlimited funds because our high net worth individuals are pretty, um, uh, are pretty endowed from that standpoint. Um, we tend to focus two to five million dollar investments uh, is sort of where we get in, which puts us in that late A, early B round uh, for investing. And so we like to see companies that have uh, kind of gotten past the stage of uh, whether they're going to survive and into how do I grow my business from wherever it is to some multiple of wherever it is. And so we're the we're that firm which comes after the institutional seed player and the uh, the typical angel investor and, and, and tries to put some uh, real institutional capital behind it. Thanks, I'm, I'm really honored to be here and, and uh, hopefully can add some time. Great, I'm Jeff Parkinson, I work for a fund called KEC Holdings. We are a uh, private venture fund in that we have no outside LPs. <coughs> Our money is uh, fully funded by one gentleman, 
gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Citron, founder of uh, Vonage and still the current chairman of the board there. And we, uh, we look at really early stage companies in the uh, you know, kind of seed and A round, I would say, as uh, most of our investments. You know, we'll kind of go across spectrum. Uh, I think we're, we're heavily, similar to Jeff, we're, we're heavily weighted in the B2B market, but we have done, um, recently done some B2C type stuff. Uh, pretty geographically agnostic as well. We've uh, done a couple international deals as well as, you know, a number of deals here on the East Coast and uh, moving across, and moving west across the U.S. as well. Uh, you know, we look at, from, from check size and the seed stage, the seed stage rounds, that can really range from anything the, the 100 to 500,000 mark and then really in the A and B sector, it's uh, in the A and B series, we kind of hit the, you know, anywhere from really the million to two million So you might notice that it was a requirement for the panelists tonight that they all be named Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so the rules of the road tonight, um, every, plan, every present, presenting company gets five minutes, and then we'll have between five and ten minutes as a panel and an audience to comment. So we are ready to go. And the first one on my list is, and I apologize in advance if I butcher the pronunciation, Audicus. Did yeah, I get it right? Yeah, that's right. And you are Patrick. That's right. Come on up, Patrick. Thank you. Sure. So, yes, yeah, so more of the rules of the road for the presenting uh, folks. The panel, raise your hand. So he's going to give you a thumb. What are you going to do when there's one minute? He's going to hold up one finger to say that you're down to one minute. Who's going to hold over here? Steve, is going to Hi everyone, thank you very much for, for having me. My name is Patrick Freuler, and I'm the founder CEO of Audicus. Uh, Audicus is an e-commerce company that makes uh, hearing aids up to 75% more affordable and also a lot cooler and discreet. So <clears throat> there's two re really big problems that the, the hearing industry currently has. Um, the first one is that hearing aids are very, very expensive. Uh, the typical price for a pair of hearing aids in the U.S. is between $3,000 to $7,000, so it's $2,000 a unit, and they're typically not covered by insurance. So <clears throat> it's, a, it's really a prohibitive factor for a lot of people and explains why uh, the adoption rate of hearing technology is very, very low here. Um, if you can appeal the audience, though, uh, the, the price is less dictated by the technology, but rather by the markups that occur in the value chain. In other words, there's markups on the manufacturing side of the equation. Uh, but most importantly, there are markups on the retail side. So the pink bar um, that you see on the right-hand side, uh, up to 70% of the $2,000 is driven by retailers. So Audicus does something very simple. Um, we remove the middleman and serve people directly. And serve people directly through our online portal. So instead of uh, you know dealing with uh, people that scale up the price, we sell the exact same quality product um, at a 75% discount. So instead of 2,000 bucks, it's 500 dollars. That's the first thing we do. The second thing we do is we focus on products that um, are kind of the next generation of uh, of hearing aids. So they're uh, very far detached from like the traditional clunky big devices that sit behind the ear and. You know, come with a big tube and make you look either old or handicapped. And uh, you no, know, these devices are kind of far more in the consumer electronics end of the spectrum. They're very discreet. They sit inside of the ear canal, and they basically give the user full control on how they sit inside of the ear. Um, it consists of the hardware, uh, which you can see on you know the respective fingertips, and the the sleeves uh, where basically the hearing aid goes into and so the sleeves have different sizes and shapes uh, depending on the the ear canal so it's far more of a consumer electronics accessory um, or at least we're positioning it as such uh, compared to the old school <coughs> medical device the process is very simple it's a it's a direct to consumer online e-commerce uh, site you land on our page you browse our products um, in a second step you upload the prescription which uh, basically tells us uh, how pronounced your hearing loss is, uh, if you have any other conditions. And we then use this, um, this information to basically custom program the hearing aid to your 
to your hearing needs. So it's very similar to, to eyeglasses. Um, you know, people have different degrees of, of vision loss and does they require different lenses. Uh, in the case of hearing aids, uh, the hearing aid needs to be programmed accordingly. Um, you know, we then uh, basically send you a custom program to hearing aid within two days. Uh, you receive it at the doorstep. You have 45 days to try it out. Uh, tons of warranties. We have an audiologist on staff that can kind of guide you through the process. And, um, you know, we're just generally very, very friendly people on the phone. Um, we launched in June, and so far we've done uh, quite well, uh, I think. We, uh, we're still a very small team uh, of uh, the, uh, about three people. So we, uh, we started with 18 units in, in July. Until now, we basically scaled the whole thing to about 127 units and had a, about a sale, um, a year, monthly sales rate of about $64,000. So we, we just surpassed our 750K yearly run rate, which I'm uh, quite excited about. And uh, you know, we're aiming for that, that upper red bar. And um, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. I'd love to take your questions. Wow, record. What, what is the technology, I guess, without going into everything, I guess, the technology behind it that allows you guys to make this for so much cheaper than the guys who've been doing this for so long? Uh, so, shall I repeat a question or? Yes. So the, yes. the question was what, uh, what allows us yes. to be, uh, you know, much cheaper than, uh, than the other guys. Uh, the answer is that it has less to do with the technology itself. It has to do with uh, the channel. Maybe I was a little fast here. But um, you know, happy to walk you through that that slide. So basically, you know, you see the the two thousand um, dollars bar on the left hand side. That's a price for a hearing aid right now. Most of that price is dictated by by the retailer. So it's basically the guy who sells you the hearing aid, provides you with the service, tests your hearing, and uh, provides you all the warranties. So we basically remove that middleman and serve the person directly. So it's the exact same technology. The exact same quality, just delivered in a different way. Are you, do you get those hearing aids from the same manufacturers? Is that, are they all the same? So right now, the um, uh, the traditional channel sources their products from four guys. Uh, it's a very consolidated industry, um, and then there's a handful of small, independent, you know, pretty innovative, innovative uh, manufacturers. These are the guys we partner with. So startups that that are working on cool hearing technology. So, yep. just to lay it on top of that, understanding your production cost, uh, if you're if you're not dealing with manufacturer markup, where what's your cost in that five hundred dollars? So we, we buy our products for um, roughly two hundred dollars. Okay, so you need three hundred dollars a margin. Right now, how, how much does it cost for, from your e-commerce marketing, reaching customers, etc.? How yeah. much more cost do you have in that business? What's your margins? I guess is my point. Okay, so uh, we have about 62-ish percent gross margins, so that includes the cost of the product, and uh, uh, I usually bake in the, the accessories and the, and the shipping. Cost. Right, so, and then you have about $120 of customer acquisition cost. So, out of those $500 that you, that you see there, that's for one hearing aid, right? So, we usually sell 1.5 hearing aids because people, you know, usually buy one or two. So, the average transaction size on our page is around $800. We, um, we oh, keep about. What, what's the price point again? I remember you had a different. So five hundred dollars for one hearing aid. Oh, oh, sorry. If you get two, okay, fine. If you get, um, yeah. So on average, it's about eight hundred, eight hundred dollars, uh, seven hundred and fifty dollars, and so we keep about sixty-two percent of that, and then we layer in one hundred thirty dollars customer acquisition costs. So um, all of this to say that we get about three hundred dollars per transaction. Is, is the customer acquisition cost the cost of actually um, learning what the customer needs? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's simpler. I mean, it's basically our entire marketing budget divided by our... Uh, change, I mean, to scale this thing, you're going to really have to change. You have to really improve. I mean, ultimately, 167 or whatever number you had uh, of customers is wonderful in a month, but, you know, it's not interesting until there's thousands and thousands and thousands, right? So yep. what, what do you estimate ultimately scaling this business, the need of the business at scale to be? Yeah, so... Um, the, the overall market is approximately 40 million people with hearing loss. Okay. So, I mean, it's a, usually, yeah, it's, and out of those 40 million people, okay. only about 25% actually have a hearing aid. So, you know, you have a very big market to tap into right here. Um, right now, uh, frankly, we've spent 
very little money on, on marketing. Um, you know, we're spending roughly eight thousand dollars a month on marketing. Uh, so a lot of it, uh, you know, still requires more resources and, and uh, for us to develop more channels and so on. That's my question. So when you start to scale this, yeah, that's going to that's going to increase, right? So at scale, where do you see the margin breakdowns? Is the five hundred dollar per unit cost uh, still going to be attractive ultimately to it? Is that I, I'm assuming you're at some point going to raise some capital, right? That's what you're right, doing. Right. Right. So what is the use of capital? How do you see this thing getting to, to the point where it's scaling? And ultimately, where do you see the size of the business? Right. So the uh, the, the the cost of the product um, for us is uh, is probably going to go down as we scale up in volumes, and our margins are going to get better, and so on and so forth. Um, so right now, with most of our uh, you know our marketing budget is first of all going to continue into online, so more of uh, banner, SEO, SEM, and so on and so forth. And then it's you know kind of. Uh, Developing more business development type partnerships that can allow us to reach the, the customer demographics uh, that we want. So, for instance, right now we're uh, discussing things with Walgreens. Um, we're discussing some partnerships with uh, nursing home chains. So there's a there's a few kind of you know bigger partners that, that we're going to go after. Do you brand the product? Or uh, we do. You do. Right. So we we basically private label our products um, with our with our name. So you know if you. See, this is, uh, this is our homepage. So we usually buy our products under a different name from our manufacturer, and then sell it as the Audicus, um, you know, A Swing or Agi. Can you give me a little bit of an indication for what your customer research tells you about your brand and about the product itself? Because um, I'd be interested to find out, you know, what their vision of it is or what their reaction to it is. Do they think they feel it's high quality? Do they? Give me some comparatives. I'm not, I'm not familiar with your name. Yeah, I mean, so far, um, you know, from our existing customers, people have been uh, been quite happy. They usually compare this with uh, at least the the people who had earring aids before, and they usually compare this with what they used to have, and they say it's completely at par. Uh, you have to keep in mind that about 70 percent of our customers are first time users, so they don't have a real reference point. Seven zero. Seven zero. Seven zero. Yeah. Seven zero. Which is great because it uh, really demonstrates that we're opening up the Absolutely. market. So, uh, so from that standpoint, the uh, the perception is first of all, people associate Audicus with uh, with a you know, low cost solution, a real alternative to the expensive audiology channel, and uh, the second kind of positioning is really the design and the credibility that comes with it. I mean, you know, besides uh, this looking like a, a relatively clean page, in my opinion, is uh, they were featured in the New York Times and CNBC and a series of other, um, you know, good publications that you know uh, lend credibility to our model. And the reviews have, have been good. So, how is the uh, how is the change in healthcare? Lot. Have you have you been following as these as the healthcare laws are changing? Whether this starts to include things like uh, hearing aids, and I mean, obviously that would that would put a lot of pressure on the business if all of a sudden insurance companies started to cover, you know, existing products out there. I would think. So, I mean, have you followed that as yeah, as well? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, from a um, from a public sector standpoint, right now there's no Medicare nor Medicaid coverage for for hearing aids. So. Uh, in fact, the only guys really cover hearing aids is the VA, the Veterans Affairs. Um, there's been a bit of an inroad uh, to um, give people a $500 tax break um, that's kind of stalled in Congress for about two to three years now, even while the reform was going on. And uh, no one really believes in, in that uh, going forward. So I don't think the, the public sector is going to do much there. Um, uh, to be frank, I think the, the the private sector, private insurance scheme is more opportunity for us to go in there and say, look, you have a low cost solution that you can add to your portfolio, and so you know, give us access to your customer base, and you know, we could potentially even be a lead generation channel for you guys. So, but you know, the one thing you have to keep in mind, and that's um, uh, very very important to keep in mind when you go into this type of business, is that. Uh, well, it looks like an over-the-counter solution where you buy a gadget online. Uh, it's actually, you know, very service intensive. It comes with a lot of hand-holding. You have to touch base with the customer throughout the entire process. Um, from the moment he lands on, our, on your site, from the moment he does a transaction, you upload the prescription, you have to have an audiologist screen it and okay it. Then you have to guide the, whole, the, the, the guy throughout the whole process. And that's something that, you know, requires a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of face time uh, or phone time, so to speak. And you know, this is something that uh, United Healthcare and most of these other uh, competitors have vastly underestimated, completely underestimated. So, can we give some comments? Yes, go ahead. We have about a minute and a half left. Okay. Go ahead. 
So, um, in, on, on the pro side, um, my thoughts are, are very um, positive, which is that um, I, I'm a really big believer in niche businesses. So, to me, you fit every um, piece of DNA in that, you know, in that, in that, in that sense. Um, at the same time, I think that positive can also be a negative, right? So you get you get pigeonholed in being this, you know, the hearing aid guys, right? I believe, I'm sure you do as well, I haven't, haven't met you or haven't had the time to, to chat, but I believe there's a much bigger play here, right? If you can build trust with that, uh, and relationships with those folks who are buying this, we have an aging population, it's certainly global, there are other uh, other countries that are in, you know, have much aging, more aging populations than we do. You, there's all sorts of products you can bring to the marketplace in a very similar way that could be a big business. So the key to you, in my humble opinion, is driving your marketing costs to a point where you totally understand the acquisition of a customer. And that's gonna take time, it's gonna take money, and it's gonna take patience for you to be able to measure that. And so I believe what you should spend your next period of time in, uh, whether you're raising capital from a VC or not, you should really focus on how you're gonna get those KPIs, right? How you're gonna be able to get to a point in a year or two where you can say it cost me exactly within reason 10% of what, what it's gonna to cost to get to a customer. And that way you can then ha have a business where all, all of a sudden it's about putting fuel in the tank, not about understanding where we really are. So I, I applaud you, I think it's very interesting. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert in this industry by any by agents, but you're swimming in the right pond, right? And if you can build a reputation here, I, I think you got something there. Uh, no, thank you, I, uh, I agree. How much are you raising? How much are you looking to raise? So we're currently raising close to a million dollars. So that is is uh, going into you know really building out the team and the point is in marketing and, and just the scaling efforts. Good. Okay. I thought it was great. Thank you. That's appropriate. Good. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't have a lot to add. I mean, most of my questions are, are really you know in, in the deep dive type stuff <coughs> around how how distribution and, and marketing goes on and how do you keep from a really large player just coming down and, and, and you know it's at, at this stage once they you know, find out about you I, I don't know how get, I don't know this industry all that well either but it, it doesn't seem like it would be terribly challenging to either take you out in, in, in one way or another and so I think for me those are kind of the aspects that I would focus on but I mean it sounds I agree with the uh, sentiment that it's, it's a it's a really interesting product and uh, you know I, uh, it, it, it sounds like you have an opportunity to do well Trust, build trust with those, yeah. you know, yeah. those relationships. That's, that's, that's where you're going to make it. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Delightfully. Jason. Thanks. My name's Jason, and I'm worried about the future of Christmas. <laughs> we all know that feeling of holding a wrapped gift, that sense of anticipation, of taking it apart, wondering what you got, and that sense of warmth that comes from knowing that someone else put that time and that effort in to create this moment for you. I used to create this moment for my brother, who's big into video games. So I would go to the mall, I would buy a box of CDs, I would wrap it up, and I would present it to him, and I would enjoy that seeing that moment manifest itself on his, in his face as he uncovered his gift. Well, those video games, he still plays them, but he downloads them. They live online. He goes straight to his Xbox, and there's no opportunity for me to give him <laughs> that gift and create that moment for him, so I don't. I, find, I give him a gift that he likes a little bit less because I want to show him that I'm taking the time and effort to create a nice gift for him. Well, this isn't just video games. This is books, music, movies, apps, <coughs> subscriptions, all these things that we're using more and more of every day. We can't give as gifts because they don't feel like good gifts. Well, here's a gift I gave to my friend Lorna on her birthday about six weeks ago. Here's the experience that she had when she loaded this page on her iPad. No, only knowing that someone who cared about her had given her a gift and that it was her birthday. 
she read a little note that said that there was a gift underneath and a personal message. And then she had the experience of digging through that time that we underestimated Mount Fuji, the time that we got lost in, in Taiwan. And she got to feel that anticipation of wondering what was underneath there, what I had given her, and at the same time relive the warmth of these memories and know that no one else could have picked these pictures, that I must have put in that effort to create this moment for her. And ultimately, she dug through, and it was points on JetBlue, for her to, to visit from Washington, where she, where she studied, to Boston, where I was, uh, and to go on our next adventure together. But the, the way I would have had to deliver this gift without delightfully <coughs> is through an email from JetBlue, in which she was immediately who it's from, what it is, and there is no moment, there's no experience around that. So, this is Laura. So this is, this is what Delightfully does, is we allow, we're a web service that allows consumers to trade a couple of their dollars, a little bit of their time, put up their, their, their own content, and within a minute and a half, two minutes, create a web page that is interactive and creates this experience around the digital gifts that we use all the time today, but we are not giving. Uh, there are a lot of folks that are interested in this space because the gift card market alone is $109 billion and growing rapidly. Uh, and those that books, music, movies, these are all billion dollar segments that are also <laughs> moving from the physical world to the digital world very quickly. There are a lot of other companies in this gift giving space, but they have a very different take. These other companies are optimizing on the gift giver, making it as easy as possible for you to send that gift, like really as few clicks as possible, as if the, the lower the friction is, the more the people will give and the better these companies will do. Us, on the other hand, it's not about as few clicks as possible. It's about translating that intent to show meaning into a really great experience. Uh, and so while everyone else is trying to go this way, as make it as easy as possible for the giver, we're trying to make it as great as possible for the recipient. Much in the way, filling that role that gift wrapping plays today. Well, how do we reach a lot of customers? You know, give this, this customer acquisition cost is the fundamental problem of all of these gift companies. Uh, so, but we're in a unique position where, where we can add value to the merchants and meet, reach gift givers where they're already shopping. So this is an example that's live on the internet today of where you can shop on someone else's website, purchase on their website, and through our integration with this website, feeds straight into our wrapping system. So you learn about us here. Oh. All right, looks like I've gone over. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm. You can finish, do you want to finish up real quick? Finish up, no. sure. Finish it up real quick. Okay, well, uh, so this is an example of a gift that we gave to show another part of that customer acquisition piece where uh, gave a gift to a friend, did not have any expectations, actually really difficult for her to put it on, on Facebook, but she did. Uh, Many people liked it the day after her birthday. Uh, this led to over 100 views and three signups. We didn't ask her to do it, but she, but she did it anyway. This is the team, this is the, the founding team. We're from different parts of MIT. I'm myself from the business school, my partner's from the media lab. Uh, and we're, you know, computers, we have a computer in everyone's pocket now. There are all these different sensors. It doesn't have to be digging through pictures, it could be playing games, it can be solving crossword puzzles, going on scavenger hunts. There's this wide world now that we have the creativity that code allows us, this wide world that we're opening up on how we can relay meaning and create very special gift experiences. Thank you. So Jason. Yes. Um, first of all, I applaud you. It's, it's um, I, I'm, I've seen a lot of different things in my life here. <laughs> and I've, I've, I've never seen a take on this market from this perspective. And I, I, I applaud you for that because it's pretty interesting. I've seen five gift companies over the last couple of years and they all look exactly the same. I think that chart you put up is probably the most powerful chart. 
Um, at the same time, I want to be, uh, I want to fully understand it. Uh, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I want to understand why you believe um, that perspective is going to be um, transformative in this particular industry. Because I still think you have, you have the same issues that any kind of e-commerce or any kind of app company is going to have, which is very high cost of acquisition, um, you know, uh, uh, obviously adoption, you, you have to keep multiple constituents um, at bay, <coughs> clearly you have to build partnerships, and I'm not saying that's the wrong thing, it, it's just, it, it's a very crowded market right now. Right. So um, I'd love to just hear in a minute or so, you know, so, sort of how you think about that, and, and frankly, really where you are, is this an idea, or is this really in, uh, you already have real proof points, I mean, where, how many customers, et cetera. Uh, so start with the beginning, where you mentioned what is the, why are we different than than other folks that are out there right now? I think I know why you're different. It's more about why do you think that your view of being different is going to be um, more successful, I guess. So we, it's, it's from a customer. So on day one, we started not just building things, but, but interviewing people and building what what they said. And what they Which told, customer? Uh, the thoughtful gift giver who does not want to give that Amazon gift card, mm -hmm. right? So this, this this product started when I was a groomsman at a wedding and my, my buddy wanted to say thanks to the wedding party with an Amazon gift card. Instead of emailing us that gift card, he prints it out, buys a gift bag, puts it inside there and wrapping paper on top of it and gives us these bags. Mm -hmm. uh, because this is an occasion where that, that convenience is not what he's trying to get. No, that emotion's huge. And, and we see it every day in the handwritten note. Right, the handwritten note is is less efficient a way of communicating, but it shows totally. this this it conveys this level of thoughtfulness. That that's what we're tap, tap, tapping into. So these are this segment of consumers, uh, Facebook and Rap and Gift. These companies they're not for them. They're for the folks that want to make it. I just want to get you that ten dollar Gap gift card as easily as possible with as little work as possible. So let's say I buy that, which I do. I think that's, that's why it was unique. It doesn't change the economics, right? Yeah, so, so the other companies are a platform for uh, resellers of gifts. Mm -hmm. For us, they have that, that challenge of paying for the most expensive keywords and uh, having to fight this customer acquisition battle. Where, where we're different is because we are a, a presentation service, we can tap into e-commerce checkout processes, and we have the first two live today. We have another 10 in queue. We have another five Shopify partners ready for that, waiting for our plug-in, where they can easily add this service to the to, to after their checkout process, and then feed us customers. So you're you're, you're not looking to. This is not hand-in-hand -hand combat for you. This is about PD. Get get your partners. Let them use their you know customers. In essence, and offer you as a service on top of the activity, which is the purchase. Exactly, and then once we have a great experience, and, and both, so for every one of those that check out through our service, mm -hmm. the gift giver and the gift recipient become aware of us, and anyone the gift recipient shares to. Uh, so what, what I'm, what I'm betting, we don't have all the evidence yet. We launched recently. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, we we've, we've given, uh, we have a very small amount of revenue, but we do have folks that are enjoying the service <coughs> anecdotally success sure. of, of delivering on our intent. Mm -hmm. uh, but where we're different from those other companies, we can drive that customer acquisition cost down because these customer, these merchants want to add us to their service and deliver us to these customers. Actually, I would say you're probably not, well, maybe you are, driving the customer acquisition down. I'd say you're actually increasing their um, uh, relationships with, with, with those customers and therefore long, uh, long tail, which is you know their lifetime value of those customers. And, um, I mean that's part of what the value prop that we're we're presenting to them, but we're not we're not looking to be a white label service that just serves merchants and helps that relationship. You know, we want that is a, a channel that, that we're aligned in serving the gift giver in that moment, and now once that gift giver gives through our service through that merchant site, that they are aware of us, and then we have ways of bringing them in. Like we can now hold on to that, gift. you know, log in through our site and come back to us. And these are things that the purely transactional gift companies, uh, they, don't, they, they don't have the experience to, to bring people back. Okay. How much are you charging for, for it? Uh, the, the version that we have live online right now is $3 per wrapping. 
So just like the, the kiosk in the mall, where you come out with your gift and you just spent $30 and for a couple minutes waiting in line and three more dollars of, your, uh, of yours, mm -hmm. that you can create a better presentation. We want to do that, or we tend to do that for e-commerce across the internet. So, and you're fundraising now to, are you fundraising? So we are, we are not fundraising at this moment. What, oh, what okay. we're down here for is uh, we have enough money to, to be able to tell the story of really how much does this cost, how much how many people are using it. Uh, and, and to meet folks who are who want who might be willing to kind of join us on this ride as we as we go on it, who, who and listen to where people have questions about what, what the model looks like. Uh, we have enough money from uh, family and friends and, and one angel up in Boston to uh, to really prove out a lot of that stuff to show that the first 25 partnerships and say look this is how we get to 2,000. What is the um, I, I'm the quick gift gift giver. You know, kind of the last minute guy that buys it. So how uh, how long does it take me to actually go and, and kind of thoughtfully build this out, and then from there, <laughs> from there, what is kind of you, you mentioned two thousand partners. What's what's kind of critical mass in terms of usage per month for you guys? Like like at what level of number of people that use this service per month do you do you find that and now you've really proven that you can that you can take this to the next level? Uh, to answer your first question, you can build what I built for uh, my friend Lorna in 45 seconds. Uh, if you have, we, we allow you to easily access your pictures on Facebook. Um, so less than the time of wrapping a gift, but maybe three times the time of uh, a wrap for someone who really is about just getting it out the door. Um, uh, as, as your question about like where, where do we find like, a tipping point, yep. I'm not sure there is one. Actually, I mean, if there is one, then I, I don't know it. I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about how uh, how well people convert on those on those merchant pages um, about the retention. I mean, it's a lifetime value is a question that I have for myself that we're trying to figure out. So I, mean, I could make up a number of what sounds good. I, I guess uh, maybe good. a different way to ask it: What do you what do you hope to your know, conversion percentages are for every partnership <coughs> that you have? That so I go in and I, let's say you're partnered with Amazon, I go and buy an Amazon gift card. What do you what do you hope that conversion rate is to uh, like in, in your opinion to where you think you uh, you know it, it's a meaningful number? I guess if we can show a lift from the current conversion rates for these merchants, yep. then I know that they'll also have because when I, I you know I've talked to several dozen of them. And they are looking for something that will that will show a even a low percentage lift in that conversion rate. Um, what do you share with them? How much of the three bucks? Uh, so I I charge I ask them to pay one dollar, and they can charge whatever they want. Oh, I see. So, so they can offer it for free. So some of our some of our uh, some of our merchants who have two hundred dollar items, they say, well, I don't want to nickel and dime my customer. I'm happy to pay you a dollar if you can show that they even like. This. Uh, other folks who are who are doing more uh, $15 gift cards but selling a lot of them, well, that $3 is really meaningful, or two of those three would be really meaningful. Last question is um, protecting your, I mean, IP. Sure. So, so uh, ultimately, I haven't decided whether or not you, you're, um, uh, and I'm by no means an expert, um, <laughs> whether you're a, a business or a feature, okay? And I don't look at it the wrong way. Sure. It's just, a, I can't move reason in my mind. And and so for me, it's all about how protectable is this thing, right? So what's going to prevent other people from coming in and building a, an interesting technology to me is not a differentiator. It's, it can always be built. So it's the relationships, I think, ultimately with the e-commerce with the e providers that's going to do that. So uh, how do you lock, you know, lock these up? How do you create win-wins for both? How do you build a maintainable business model? How do you build a customer loyalty? All those things are going to be differentiator so I, I agree completely and it's something that, that we've thought about since day one uh, and that's why these these partnerships or being the first one to plug into a website and serve uh, where we are where we do have a common interest in serving the gift giver with us and the merchant to have those those partnerships established uh, because even if there are other folks that come in and try to do the same thing yeah that the, the switching costs of a merchant to drive that up as, as much as possible by first integrating very seamlessly and then providing a lot of options. So right now you've seen one uh, uh, one example of how to take a gift apart. Well, that is really unbounded in what we can provide there. So to integrate as many as we can, 
and then provide a lot of options and a very smooth experience for the merchant so that they don't have reason to switch. Plus we have a, we filed a provisional patent application for that party. Cool. Great, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Okay, next one, lesson face. returns um, what the industry is and I guess how we compare uh, so the industry is at around 20% uh, return um, it's, a, it's a very high rate and in fact uh, you know it explains uh, or it's, it's, it's driven by the price tag that audiologists impose because you go to the clinic you buy something at six thousand dollars you go home and you're like okay it's uh, I can hear better definitely a lot better but is it six thousand dollars worth better and Kind of triggers that that return. Our case, um, Audicus is about a 10% return rate, so about half the industry standard. Um, we started at around 20%, and over the last four or five months, uh, kind of massaged it down to about <coughs> six to seven percent. So blended, about 10 to 11 percent. So a lot of it is really, you know, how much hand holding you do, how how you present the, the product, and you know how you guide it the whole process. Great, thank you. All right, so I'm going to shift the spotlight back to Claire. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claire Cunningham, and I'm here to present Lesson Face, which is a platform for live music, live music lessons done online. Uh, so we just launched in September of 2012, and we also closed the seed round uh, about a week after our launch. Um, we've had a really strong initial response. Lifetime value is, of course, a metric that we've been tracking really closely. And we've already had students um, come back as many times for lessons that they've had a lifetime value as high as $600, and we will exceed that later this week. So I was going to show a demonstration of what it's like to get into a lesson on lesson phase. Um, so this video will show from the point of view of somebody who's already booked a lesson. Uh, so I'll just start really briefly with how you set up a lesson and how lesson phase works in general is uh, that teachers set up profiles and then interested music students can browse the profiles, sign up for a, an account, and then view the teacher's schedule, and then they can book and pay for a music lesson. So this this video shows what the interface is like for somebody who is already signed up for that music lesson. Uh, so they're able to log into the account on lesson page. And we didn't speed this up um, or edit the video just so you get an accurate idea of what it's like. So this student actually has two lessons set up. Um, on the interface. Uh, one tip for video chatting, if you ever need to video chat, shut down other programs before you actually get into it for uh, the best experience. Um, we partnered with a, a video conference uh, platform called Fuse Meeting, which provides amazing audio and visual quality. Um, so the way the system works, and it's from the student's perspective that we're seeing now, is that the teacher has to allow you to come into the meeting which allows it to be a very secure environment for everyone. Um, so in this video, in conference. I'm actually the, uh, the teacher. And we're seeing it from um, the perspective Hi. of Ashford. Who Hi. How's it going? And if you hey. go to full screen, cool. 
Um, and then here's a clip of an actual lesson-based session. This is with Dwayne Dennison, who is a uh, guitar guru from cult classic, um, cult favorite, sorry, the Jesus music. So that's just a brief uh, walkthrough so you can see what it looks like. Okay. Oh. Right. So who are we? I am the co-founder and CEO. I've had leadership roles in several media and publishing companies in the past few years, and I have an MBA from MIT. My co-founder is Ashford Tucker. He is uh, in the legal <coughs> department at Epic Records, and uh, he has a JD from, from Vanderbilt. And just last week, we welcomed Brandon Symes as director of marketing. Um, he moved here from Boston to join Lesson Face, and uh, we are very excited to have him on board. Um, teachers on Lesson Face, uh, we have assembled a great roster um, already, including a Grammy winner, <coughs> one of Spin's top 100 guitarists of all time, uh, teachers who have taught Justin Bieber and P. Diddy, uh, teachers who have performed Barbara Streisand and Yo-Yo Ma, and a ton of just great teachers with a lot of teaching experience. So our first 10 weeks since the launch, um, we've already pushed a couple of, of new dev uh, updates um, in response to what we saw in our initial traffic. Our average visit duration at time of launch was four minutes, and as of last week, we had increased that to nine minutes. Uh, we've had an average ticket of twice the projection that we sold our seed round upon, um, which is, of course, a really exciting um, number for us. And uh, we've increased our sign up per unique visitor from 4% at time of launch to 8% as of last week. You may be wondering what the market size is um, for music lessons. Uh, we've computed it at $2.4 billion globally, and we are thinking globally here. Uh, our teachers are already stretched as far as Tasmania and India. Um, and so you can see that we have a very strong representation in the Northeast, um, but we are aiming to let people experience uh, global music, as well as to let people in other parts of the globe experience American music. So going forward, we're looking to scale. Our platform that we've built already is extremely scalable. Um, we want to just uh, get all of the music lessons online happening on Lesson Phase. So thanks very much, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Very cool. <laughs> How are you acquiring your customers? We're doing it through online market, through Facebook, <coughs> through Google AdWords. Um, we have been treading pretty lightly in the first couple of months, um, acquiring a lot of them through the uh, social networks that we just personally have as the, the founders, as well as the teachers' networks. Um, musicians are extremely social. Uh, I, Musicians were the last people on MySpace, and they're the first people on Google Plus. And so we've been uh, developing the, the social aspect of the business really strongly, and that seems to be um, working out pretty well so far. Uh, so socially and um, Google AdWords are our main acquisition channels today. How do you expect to scale up? What do you, what do you plan on doing? Uh, Increasing um, the Google AdWords spend as well as uh, creating a lot of um, community with the, the teachers themselves. Um, we've seen a lot of really positive response through doing outreach through the teachers, and as well as that being very effective and it's very cost effective as well. What do you charge? What is, how do you, and how do you split that? <coughs> We we launched doing 15% of, so teachers are able to set their own rates and schedule, and we take 15% of the lessons that they sell, at, that they sell, and we're, we're testing and thinking about other revenue channels as well. 
How many uh, time slots do most of your, are most of your teachers willing to give, and then how many kind of what do you what do you think that student to teacher balance has to be to allow for an appropriate amount of optionality for on, on both ends? Uh, the the teachers have been there's a lot of variability with what the teachers have done so far. Some of them have just opened a couple of hours on a Saturday morning or something like that, and. Others of them have made their schedule extremely open. Um, it seems from the offline model that an ideal number of teacher uh, of students per teacher is somewhere between 20 and 30 per week. Um, we have seen with the online uh, format that most people are coming back every two weeks, um, so that number may be a bit higher for the number of students that they would be able to take. And just other question on back end cost. Do you, do you pay for bandwidth through your your partnership, or how does how does that work with the um, with the provider? Was it Fuse? Is that what you? Use? It is it is Fuse, and it it is not a free service. We do pay for licenses through it, but we've set up a, a model that works. Okay. Um, Somebody's saying "ooh" in the audience, sorry, so I, I just, just you know I. I just quick question. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, I'll it's so rare that we get an ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been a student of music uh, in sort of the you know, in, in face uh, lessons and all. Um, when you come to online, how much of it is can you tweak here and there? And also, in terms of the scope of online lessons you offer, is it purely guitar based or do you offer things like classical music? Or, you know, I'm sure that's dependent upon the instructors you have, but sort of what is your span? Sure, yeah, so um, in terms of the, the interface, the video conference solution we use, we chose because it has really good audio and visual quality. It's very reliant on bandwidth of the student and the teacher, how, how good it is um, going to be actually in the lesson. but. We've found in our lessons so far that what you lose in the ability to actually be in the same room with them, you make up for in other ways. You know, it's extremely convenient. You can do it from anywhere. Um, you can uh, record it. We don't have the recording feature yet, but that's one thing that we want to do very soon. And people can do their own recording. Um, and then in terms of the instrument uh, breadth and depth we offer, we do have a lot of guitar teachers, but we also have an extremely wide breadth of uh, lessons that we offer. We have claw hammer banjo, we have mountain dulcimer, we have harmonium, um, and we have all kinds of styles, voice. Uh, we're aiming to be extremely wide, any sort of music lessons that you want. We and can find you a teacher. Do you find students coming back to the same instructor on a regular basis? We do. We, uh, we've been tracking um, how well, individual instructors do uh, in terms of retention very closely. And yes, uh, teachers and students definitely create re relationships. Um, the best instructors are ones that are, you know, they're very charismatic and inspiring and they keep you coming back week, week to week. One more question. Uh, I'd assume you've got a lot of competitors that do this. Uh, how's the competitive landscape and what prevents the customer and the teacher from just going and doing their own Skype session and so, saving the 15%. So the, the question was what was the competitive <coughs> landscape and what prevents the teacher and the customer from doing their own Skype session? <coughs> there, it is kind of a hot area right now, um, but I don't believe that any of the competitors have really established a brand um, other than Skype perhaps. And I would say that Skype, uh, the, the Skype and PayPal alternative um, is, for 15%, we're adding at least that much or more value to the interchange. We make it secure. We create the scheduling system. And then most of all, I think, is our the audio and visual quality of the platform. Um, at least right now that we're adding to this uh, interchange, um, our the the Fuse meeting platform is is superior in terms of tonal range, in terms of latency, and just in generally in terms of the audio and visual quality. 
to Skype. So I, it hasn't been a tough pitch to teachers, and we haven't, we've actually seen much higher retention than we were anticipating. So <coughs> tracking retention for teachers, you know, on the one hand, it's because we want to see who's a great teacher, and we also, you know, are looking out for people that might scamper off I, of the site. I think there's there's always bad apples in every, you know, but I think you can't build this at unless you're fine with that. I think this is, let me my comments. I think there are, um, you're, you're, you're on a trend line that's very hot right now, right? Which is um, online lessons for all sorts of stuff. I, ironically, I was in another one of these panels, I don't know, six months ago, and I heard a company very similar, but not focused on music, focused on all sorts of stuff. But their their hook was um, some way similar to yours, which is that um, they had very accomplished people on their platform. So that's going to be your success criteria, right? If I'm a person who wants to take lessons with the guy who taught Yo Yo Ma, that's pretty impressive, right? And, and I'll. <laughs> but I, I'm a guitarist, right? So, and I'm, I have a son, a 14-year-old son, who's actually like perfect for this because he's taking lessons. Which we love our guitar teacher, but he's taking lessons. But he probably spends 15 hours a week on YouTube, right? Watching all the guitar lessons, learning Stairway to Heaven, doing the things that he does, right? To to practice his skills. So I think there's an audience for you. Now, whether it's 2.4 billion, I don't know. I think that ultimately you're going to have. Uh, you, your ability to actually aggregate the right people, um, make the stable of your teachers impressive <coughs> enough, right? That's going to cost you some dollars, and you're going to have to figure out how to do that. But if you've got that, then I think the value you bring to them is humongous. What I would um, concentrate on personally is making the transition from um, just supporting teacher income, you know, supplementing that income, to a primary platform for them, right? They, never, they may never give up their, their, their world of, of teaching face to face, but if they know that if you're a reliable source of adding to that income and creating value there, you become indispensable to them. And then, and then you become protectable in some sense. They're not, the switching cost is too high, especially if they have relationships, and, and locking up those relationships is probably key for you. Um, the second thing is, ultimately, you have to think bigger than music, right? I mean, I really believe that the online lesson um, with a uh, performance quality person is a big industry. Um, limiting it to music, while big enough, is a good place to start and very, and very uh, concentrated, but ultimately if you want to attract the real investment dollars and probably get some significant exit for yourself, um, you have to think a little bit bigger. But other than that, I think you're onto something, and, and I would concentrate highly on uh, making that experience the best it can be, right? Because it's got to be, you have to say to the audience, well, what you're getting on YouTube is so far inferior to what I'm about that, I'm, that you need to be willing to pay for that. Right. That's the key. If you want to get your son, I guess there's a people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're taking donations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Thanks so much. Next one is Care Booker. Sky and Jenna. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Jenna. I'm oh, Sky. And uh, I bet the question you're all asking is what is Care Booker? Since we're here today to present that. Um, so, Care Booker <coughs> helps you book family care services online the easy way. And by family care, we mean things like child care, such as babysitting pet care like pet boarding or dog walking, uh, tutoring and lessons including music lessons and um, also things like uh, acting lessons, other, other lessons that you can take anywhere. An easy way to kind of sum up uh, the, the one-liner uh, pitch for Carebooker is that we're the Expedia.com for booking all of your family care services in one place. So you come to our homepage, you search for the type of care service you're looking for, you pick what type of uh, time frame you're looking to book it, and it looks at the real-time schedules of those care providers and shows you the search results. When you view the search results, you can see key stats, such as the number of appointments completed, their response rate, and their reviews. The key thing about our reviews is that they're certified reviews, meaning you only could have written that review if it was a completed appointment where a financial transaction took place, so very high quality reviews. Um, you can also easily book appointments and interviews, as well as you'll see that everyone has their own background check. We offer free background checks for all care providers. Um, I think we're probably the only service provider at Leave. Not only do we provide a free background check, but moms and dads can click that background check and see exactly what that background check covered. 
from proof identity, to if they have any criminal backgrounds or sex offending uh, histories, but you can actually see what it covered. But we're not just like Expedia. We're also sort of like Indeed for care. So just like Indeed took all these other job sites and pulled it into one primary place for people to search for jobs, uh, Carebooker takes a bunch of partners from all the care sectors, from all the family care, pet care sites, child care sites, tutoring and lesson, home care, pulls it into one place so that we can really be the one-stop shop for finding care online, even if after that you go to different places to actually book it. Yeah, a good example of this would actually be like lesson phase would be a, a key type of partner that we would look to, to work with, where we would take all of their uh, tutors or care providers and onboard them onto our site so you can find them and then book with them either through our platform or through theirs. So we also have a dash of PayPal in our system with a button called the Book Care button, which instantly gives providers a real-time booking platform on their own websites so that they don't just people don't just have to find them through our site, they can actually go to the person's site and book with them then through carebooker.com. If you think what PayPal did, they really allowed everyone to put a button on your own website to create your own e-commerce platform. By placing this button, we go one step further than the PayPal button. By putting it on your website, again, you have your real-time book, you can see when you're available, as well as a payment platform. <clears throat> a little about our team. Uh, myself, Sky, I'm a current venture capitalist at a venture fund in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, and our team, about two to three years ago, we built the first online booking platform for pet care. And we realized there was a much bigger opportunity um, to really focus on all of the core family care services, which made us to start booking care worker. Um, and because we've been working so long with our team, uh, we kind of consider them our family. Uh, in fact, Jenna's my wife. Um, so <laughs> 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 um, and uh, Steve, our programmer, is pretty much built everything, uh, who's in the front row here. Uh, Jake, our designer, and we have two key advisors. We have Jim Anderson, who's the co-founder of About.com, He's helping us scale our backend tech infrastructure to make sure we can bring on a lot of users at once, as well as David Atkins, who's the co-founder of Expedia. Um, he helped originally scale it out from Microsoft and build it to what it is. Uh, David's actually looking at joining our team full-time uh, after funding. Yeah, we also have the two cutest members of our team who were our muses for starting the pet care site, <laughs> and that's uh, Casper and Scooby, our dogs. But they're uh, definitely head of play time and cuddle time. I mean, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> Very cute members on our team. Um, <laughs> Um, and if you look at the marketplace, it's really divided in two ways. There's on the left, you have directories that are premium directories, like care.com or Sitter City. Moms or dads pay about $37 a month just to get access to profiles and phone numbers and emails. But they're just discovery platforms. You can't ultimately do what you want, which is book interviews, book appointments around real-time schedules and pay online. But ever since our team launched the first platform for booking pet care, we've seen all these other platforms launch across each vertical. So you have like Urban Sitter for babysitting. With Pet Care, you have Doc Vacay. Within the music and lesson space, Take Lessons has really been the, the key one there, as many others. But all of these are great partners for Carebooker, which we can onboard onto our site. So we think there's a huge opportunity, because uh, everyone has a pet, a child, uh, they have an aging parent, or they want to book things for themselves, like fitness or sports. <clears throat> And uh, we want to be the gorilla in the room when it comes to family care services, the main place that people go when they're thinking about it, booking and then so they can book online through us. So we have um, three main revenue models. We have a percentage that we take for each booking, or if you take a subscription, there's no percentage for booking, and it's uh, very competitive in the market. And we also have a revenue share with partnership agreements. And hashtag, you got to be mobile and social. <laughs> we got both of those. So we're working on a mobile app that care providers can use to actually see all of the appointments that they currently have, the details of those, so they're going to the next appointment, they can reschedule, cancel, look at their calendar, as well as social. The key part of here is if you log in with any of the social networks, you'll see that you can find people that you actually know some of those care providers and some of your friends. <coughs> and if you know someone who knows someone, then you have a much higher degree of trusting those care providers. Yep, so where are we now? We had our soft launch on November 7th, and care professionals are currently signing on to our site. We've had great feedback. People are really excited, and we're really, every day it's an uptick, so it's really wonderful to see that. We're finalizing our first big partnerships, and we also are raising a seed round of 500,000 to 1 million. So, 
I, I've known this guy for a while, so I'm in a little bit of a disadvantage, or maybe he is. Um, <laughs> he said he was going to be nice. That's right. But Jenna, you're, you're, you're awesome. <laughs> um, so, a couple things. One is, um, uh, and Lori, this is probably a better question for you. Um, is there any liability when you start to get into things like um, child care and, and those types of things? That, that's the obvious question. So, yeah. I want to. Yeah, so two, two parts to that. So, there's liability that you first question about. So, for background checks, um, as well as liability for when you're booking. So, our background checks are provided by a third party uh, company called TalentWise. So, we have no liability at actual how quality that background check is, but they do a great well, job. It is the number one provider of background checks in the country. So, we have that going for us. Yeah, so, but it is a third party someone. doing it for us. Yeah. On the other side, a liability on if you have someone taking care of your dog and for some reason a, a car hits it or they kill your dog, mm -hmm. um, it's a similar situation that dating websites fall into, where is the dating website liable if you go on a date and you date a serial killer and you get oh, killed? It's a similar situation where none of the care providers on our site were directly recommending. Um, so all of them have the process of going through interviews before you ever book an appointment. One of the key things for booking family care services versus booking a hotel or a restaurant, is you always book the interview first, right? If you're gonna leave a, your loved one with a stranger, you always do either the phone interview or an in-person interview. So it helps kind of limit some of the liability and risk you have in general. Do you interview them? I'm sorry. Um, we do not interview them all directly, although I have been talking to the recent ones that have joined just to learn about their experience with the site. but. We see it as they will actually be loading their own things onto it, and we're making it simple for them to do that. So we don't have a one-on-one -on -one interface with them unless they call us for a reason for job. We are, we are thinking about doing though a, a care booker verified to show they've actually gone through a second level of validation. That's, that, that's the next step. That would be what we're going through. Mm -hmm. oh, does each uh, individual on your site have a different rate, or like how oh, does the, yes, yeah, yeah. their pricing work? Yeah, yeah, they pick their own rates completely. Yeah, great question. So on every individual care provider's profile, they can have all the services they do by sector. So if they have child care sectors, um, pet care services, each of those listing the prices for each of them, as well as if there's any additional charge. So maybe there's an additional charge for an extra dog that you're doing or an extra child that's being babysat. We made it customizable so you can really bucket all of the prices together. And it's similar to if you're looking at a hotel, you can see starting at prices and if you go into the actual profiles, you can see very detailed things. It's almost like a, a menu of their services and the prices. Do, let's, okay, let, let me just come back here. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. I was just gonna ask, is most, of, is most of the business that you guys are actually bringing here, is it, is it kind of a, like a, like a takeaway business from the other providers out there, you know, they're on this site, now they're going to join mine. I know it's not really a one or the other. You can, you can kind of be across board, but you guys actually, I mean, how, how many people do you think are out there really that are that are now become new users of a site that were never users of a site before this versus it's just, hey, I'm, I'm currently on Sitter, dot, Sitter City or whatever yeah. it is that I move across. Yeah, so if, we, if they're on any of the directories, really they're just getting discovery advantages. They're getting additional marketing. But if they're on care.com or Sitter City, they can't actually book the interview or book the appointment or pay online with any of those clients they need. Um, so we are finding is there's a huge demand for people to start moving their clients online. So they, you don't have to play phone tag. You know, one of the biggest problems is you find someone that you might want to book with, you have to call them, leave a voice message, have them call you back, they leave a voice message. This way, you don't have to call them to see when they're available. You can see their real-time schedule, and you can book yourself, and they can accept or decline. Um, so the, the, the demand for that we're getting is pretty high. Um, but for the uptick also, we're going to see a large growth in our user base. We're not only reaching out to care providers individually, um, to each of the partnerships that we showed, that's where we get a huge um, increase in the number of care providers joining our site. Um, for example, takelessons.com, they're the leading provider of music lessons and singing lessons. They have about 30,000 care uh, tutors that they're going to be uh, onboarding onto our platform. Mm -hmm. So each of those partners really help us scale quickly. Okay, and I guess the, just the last piece of that, is it a lot for, for those guys to just kind of come on and join you, is that a lot easier? for them to do then to actually fill out some of this back-end payment and, and verification oh, technology. Completely. I mean, it's really, it's, it's just so much easier for them. They're all worried about having to do it themselves, and we give them that for basically free, plus we give them revenue share. It's a, it's a great deal for them. Yeah, they're giving them their own online booking platform and a payment platform that they don't have to pay for. Yeah, it's, it's really cool.
So it, it's interesting because um, I, I, I'm unbelievably surprised how many names you got into the presentation. So PayPal and Expedia and <laughs> SoloMo, it was, uh, it was good. Um, with that said, you know, the one that keeps popping up in my mind is, is Angie's List, right? So, um, you know, that's been around since 1969. She started as a directory. Um, I think she, she made her, her mark really more in the uh, maintenance and home, you know, home repair. Home repair. Uh, but what they have been successful in is building a huge reputation with those folks, right? So I think the customer acquisition is as challenging as anything else. So they will other uh, um, opportunity we looked at tonight. But I really believe your differentiator is gonna be in completing that transaction, whether yes. it's the financial transaction or whether it's the appointment booking. I would suggest that appointment booking is a feature. So you have it now, but there's no reason why somebody else couldn't have it later yeah. on. Yeah. And you can white label that, that's fine. Yeah. Um, I, I do have some questions about why you got so broad at first, which is your prerogative. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think it is, um, I think it's going to be incumbent upon you to be able to get out there quickly. Okay. So, wh while I totally understand the need to raise 500 to a million um, and get your next, you know, transition point, yep. you need to raise a buttload of money quick, and, and and you're going to have to be out there attracting small, medium-sized businesses, which we all know is very hard, very expensive, and your cost per acquisition is going to be pretty high. So, yep. just be prepared for that. As yeah. You know. um, if you wouldn't mind me going back to a question you asked inside mm -hmm. of that. Um, you were saying, why did we go with such brand yeah. and starting? Well, usually the same person books all of these services. The so it's usually the mom. I understand so that. So it's, that's you know, it's really, and also the care providers, honestly, they usually do more than one type of service. So they usually just care. Mm -hmm. And like, they, they're a tutor, they might do pet sitting, they might do babysitting. And I actually, I talked to someone the other day that's a tutor, but she said that she thought it was stupid that all these tutoring sites didn't also capitalize on the fact that she's willing to watch children and she's actually a better babysitter because she can teach them along the way. So there's a lot of people like that that That's are fair. happy yeah. to get, the get the We had a really different. important, uh, I'd say, pivot about a little over two years ago when we launched the first online booking platform for pet care. Yeah. We realized that there was a huge opportunity to do it for all of that family care services in the home. Um, and that's where we said, there's going to be a girl in the room we want to be that gorilla. I mean, look, Yext did this, right, in the lead management side, right? They, they, they came about and said, we're going to open up new channels for you, vis a vis Yellow Pages like exposure, but they did it in a way that was fair. They probably just sold that part of the business. Yep. You can do that, right? You can build, build that in this space. So if you, if you look at it purely as a distribution mechanism and you get them, um, that's great. The question and the, and the challenge is cost and getting to reach them. Yeah, and that's what the, the decreasing the cost to acquire a customer decreases dramatically with some of these key partnerships. Yeah, so, fair enough. Yeah, with like Urban Center, Doc Vake, they onboard, you know, 50,000 each. It's, it's wonderful for us. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Great, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, the final, final presenter. Readable? without the mic, um, so I hope everyone can hear me. Thank you so much for, for coming um, and listening to our presentations tonight. It's great to be back in New York. I'm Carl, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Gradable. I'm really excited to tell you about our vision. So what we're doing is we're making it easier for teachers to understand data. So if you know anything about what's going on in education in the US today, you know that there's more and more testing. So there are a lot of things that look like this. With that, there's also more and more data. Pretty easy to understand. Now, teachers, while they, they happen to be great at, and we've, we've already heard some, um, some teacher-related pitches, they happen to be great at one-on-one -on -one interaction with their students and at communicating concepts, but they do not happen to be, their, their specialty is not actually Excel spreadsheets, and maybe nor should it be. Um, so that's what we do. We make it easy for teachers to understand data. So that's a really big problem. So where did we decide to, how did we decide to kind of bite off our own chunk? Well, we decided to focus, we thought that the biggest increase in data is not actually in the once a year major tests that students are being required to take, but it's actually in the daily assessment, the quizzes, the homework assignments that are not being analyzed 
right now um, by most teachers. And um, the major, we realized that the major bottleneck in that is actually the grading process. You might have guessed that I was going to talk about grading from our company name. But you may not have ever really had to ever think about it before unless you are related to or have been a teacher. But um, I'll, I'm going to share some facts with you which, which will explain why we think this is such a painful problem to solve. So the first fact is that teachers actually spend one third of their time or 15 hours a week grading. Um, and it actually happens to be a huge pain point for them as um, so as, and, and it's a big reason for teacher attrition. So right now, 50% of teachers leave the profession within five years. And 65% of those that do say that workload is a big reason <coughs> why they leave. Um, and if you, and, and also the, you know, just the fact that if you put those two things together, you realize that they're spending a ton of their time grading and they're leaving. Um, and that problem of teacher attrition is one that costs the US seven billion a year to fix. Um, so I just want to use this as an illustration to show that grading itself is a painful area um, and why we chose to focus on it. Now, back to our vision. Our vision is that every teacher and every student have something that looks like this. A personalized dashboard that shows both a high level view of a student's achievement over time and it shows individual assessments and makes it very easy to pinpoint learning gaps. Now, how, um, and the fact is that this is something that we do in every other area of business, but right now that's not possible. And the best practices that this enables are, have, there's a ton of research which shows that this, which is called data-driven instruction, can improve test scores by as much as 29%. But the fact is that the tools simply do not exist. So I'm going to show you a very quick demo of how our, our product works. I'm only actually going to show you a little bit of this because I'm a little bit concerned about time, but... So as you're looking through this, and, and I, I assume with 
so a lot of the multiple choice type testing, you're, you're focusing on, on the elementary, middle school, high school as well. I don't, I don't know where you kind of see that spectrum and where you are, but how have um, the schools kind of received this in, in terms of now I have to trust technology to take these tests and, and ensure an accuracy? There? So a couple of things. Um, we've learned a lot. We've actually been working on this full time since June. So my, my co-founder and I both just graduated from business school in June. So um, we haven't had a long time, but we've spent a year and a half doing research before we, we launched. Um, we've learned that, so to teachers, the pitch is really easy. We tell them that, so we, what we do is, we don't take teachers out of the learning process. So that's what we tell parents and what we tell administrators. We allow teachers to grade online, and we also actually auto grade. So we're using the same technology that your bank is using to read your checks to auto grade short one or two word answers and multiple choice questions. So the pitch to teachers is that we give them their nights and weekends back. The pitch to administrators is that we enable data-driven practices, which right now are so onerous and time-consuming that some of the charter schools, for example, which are using them, their average length of um, tenure for teachers is three years. So the two things, one of our partner um, charter networks, they um, told us that their two biggest goals for um, like an increasing, their two biggest operate, operating goals are basically trying to get teachers to do more analysis and trying to not get them to quit as early because they were, they're basically just leaving. It's, it's just a lot of work. Um, we, I did a lot of customer development over the summer, so I've never been a salesperson before, but I went and I talked to 14 schools. Um, I mean, essentially what we have is a workflow product, right, and we're collecting a bunch of data. So for the first two schools, I told them, we can use this data for test prep, because I thought that made a lot of sense. Um, they didn't really care. Then the next, then the next school, I asked, I said we can basically help personalize the learning process more, and they and all the next 12 schools that we talked to signed up. Um, it's more we have a waiting list of schools and teachers that are, are ready. We're kind of focusing on product development right now because um, we have to get that right. When so, you say waiting list, are you assigned LOIs? We have um, so we're not. Um, we have a, we're, so we're going directly to teachers. We we tried both. Okay, so. We've tried, um, now, as, a, as investors, you know that the education market, a lot of people um, look on it skeptically if you say you're gonna go direct to districts, right? So we have actually, we believe that schools will be the payer, but the teachers will be the user, and we're actually introducing like our introductory package price so that it's affordable enough for teachers to try it. And I'm talking like $5 a month. So Sorry, I didn't answer your question. Um, right. We have we have a couple of hundred teachers that are on our waiting list who signed up to use our beta, and we're kind of slowly rolling them in. So that's your beta. So ultimately, t talk to me a little bit about what happens once you get 500 teachers. Now where do you go? Well, um, so right now where we are, um, we've been working on the product since January of this year. Mm -hmm. um, we did an alpha test over the summer at one school, and we were basically working on the scanning process, so we got it down to one or two seconds per scan. And um, we're in closed beta right now, so we're having teachers, we're in about 12 classrooms in the Boston area. And we're just, we're spending a ton of time every single week right. in those classrooms. Um, and the feedback's been? It's been great. Um, so, well, there's a lot of like, kind of, you know, we're trying to re like remove all the friction from the process. Sure. A lot of it's more like, oh, when I did this, then can you make this over there? No doubt. So, yeah, so I mean, it's, a lot of it has been that, but I'll tell you about, um, some teachers that I met with on Thursday um, were one of our beta schools happens to be um, a school called Roxbury Prep, which is part of the Uncommon Schools Network. And um, we met with two teachers there who are trying out the product, and they said, I love this because it lets me do a more analysis. It's more flexible than Scantron because I want, I'm a math teacher. I want to see how my students think. This allows me to capture that. And I'm really excited to work with this, work on this with you guys to get this, you know, to get this to work for more teachers. So, so if I can summarize, I think what you're telling me is that during this beta process, your goal is to get enough feedback yep. from the direct users of this, yep. learn the mistakes, understand what the onboarding is going to be, create the demand, yep. such that you can ultimately get to Jeff's point, which is to sell this at a much more macro level. Because teacher right. by teacher would be really hard, right? So um, yes, that's true. Um, so we believe that this our product has, and based on feedback and kind of market feedback that we've gotten so far it has a lot of potential to go viral among teachers. We believe that if one teacher in a school is using it, it's actually going to be difficult for other teachers within that school not to find out about it. 
they say, I've got this new thing, I don't, I did my grading in five minutes. Well, that's, that's actually interesting. What about your, um, what are you learning from a user experience pers uh, perspective? In other words, are you asking them to change, you're asking them to change behaviors to some degree. So how, you said early on that, you know, they don't, they're not good at spreadsheets and stuff. Are they good at doing online, you know, uh, correction? I mean, how hard is that learning process for them? Teachers that have tried it have said that that part is actually really, really easy. My co-founder and I are both, I'm a former interface developer, he's a former product That's developer. Great. So the product part is kind of our, what we love the they, most. Yeah. Um, so they said that that part, and we try to replicate their process as much as possible. So the teacher, we talked to hundreds of teachers actually over the last year and a half, and um, they've told us that right now a lot of them, they keep an assessment on a Word doc. So we made it so they can just upload a Word doc into our system or copy and paste from the existing assessment print it out, use it exactly as they do right now. They think that it's, so far they've said that they think it's very easy, and to them the trade-off in terms of the work that they don't have to do is a big um, payoff. So, plus getting more, like, better results for their kids. So, um, my feedback is pretty simple. I mean, you're tapping into a, we all know this is a gigantic market, right? I mean, education is changing rapidly. Uh, the tools, the techniques, the, uh, the things that teachers are using have to improve, right? We know that. Uh, so data-driven on one side is for the teachers and their ability to um, be more informative to their parents and the students and the administrators. Sure. On your side, it's about uh, outcomes, driving outcomes, right? Because yes. that's where you're going to be successful. Yep. Um, it'd be interesting to see what your business model ultimately is. Yep. Um, you're absolutely right. Most PCs are scared to death about investing in these types of things because um, it is very hard to reach um, those big school districts that are very political and everything else that goes with them. With that said, it is probably a top five investment area right now. That's true. So and, yeah, that's working in your favor. So yes. I, I would get out there and try to start hitting the road if you're serious about raising some real capital. Uh, hit the road with um, what I would call the friendlies where, where you get out and say, look, we're not raising money or maybe we are. We're, we're going to come to you eventually, but we want to tell you what we're doing. Almost the pitch you just gave us, right? Yeah. We're in assessment <coughs> mode. We're, we're dealing with these teachers. We have a heck of a team. I mean, look at your resumes. They're ridiculous, right? We have a heck of a team. We think we know what we're doing, but we, we want to. We're going to come back in six months. But we're, we're going to we're going to solve the following data points before we right. do that. Right. That would be my only uh, feedback. That's kind of what we're hearing. Good. Um, the other thing too, I will say about the um, <coughs> channel is that. We're essentially just a platform, right? You can use any content, you can use, um, I mean, you can use any anything that's published, you can just use it through our system. So we're getting a lot of inbound requests, and we also um, have gotten interesting requests, like say from someone who sells data warehouses to states, mm -hmm. who make their product more valuable. And totally. There's a lot of potential, um, we're not thinking about that yet, we're trying to focus on the product, but um, we believe that that is a way that not just going direct to teachers, but we can also expand. Smart. The yeah, there's channels out there you can absolutely tag yeah. on Blackboard and others that you can have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to yeah. this great company. Terrific presentations. And, and thanks to everyone for coming. I just want to say, um, I've done a lot of these panels. And um, as a whole, uh, those five companies? Five companies. What <coughs> They, yeah, exactly. They, that was the most complete set of really well thought out companies that I've seen in one of these events um, in many, many years. So congratulations to you guys. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I know it's hard to do, but uh, uh, I'm thrilled that you guys came and presented to us. So thanks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.